Hey everyone, it is Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseScore, and welcome to today's edition of the MuseScore Cafe. So, uh, this is really special, and I'm glad to see so many people here checking it out. This is the, uh, the release of MuseScore 4, happened just in the last hour or two. Uh, lots of things had to come together to make that possible, and, um, I'm going to be showing you lots of things uh, that uh, is, you know, what makes MuseScore 4 such a big deal because it feels like I've been talking about it for years and I think I have been because that's how long it's been in development. Although this is really the first release in some time that I personally haven't been all that directly involved in the development of. I've been kind of uh, on the sidelines, um, kind of doing some, you know, my own thing and focusing on showing you all how to use this thing and learning everything I can about it and do what I can to uh, steer, you know, help to, uh, gate the, to guide the direction of it as I can. So anyhow, this is what we'll be talking about today, uh, MuseScore 4. So uh, this is MuseScore 4 that we are looking at here, right? So I'm going to just do a couple of things here. Um, to uh, just sort of orient ourselves and um, just so you can see because I do want to see comments at the same time so uh, I've, I've got that set up so I can be seeing the comments while I'm showing you stuff here so yes this is MuseScore 4 and it is um, it is all new and yet not and and this is uh, I guess one of the things to to try to explain what I really mean by this. Well, how can it be new and not new? If you look at it, compare. Oh, seriously? Oh God, really? Frozen screen? Frozen screen? I don't think so. Is anyone else seeing a frozen screen? Do you see it scrolling? I see it scrolling on my system. Uh. So y'all, let me know. Uh, my other system that I'm monitoring on seems to be okay. Yeah, all right. So I think it's fine. I think maybe you just need to refresh your screen, Dennis, or something. So uh, let me just compare and contrast here. Let me bring up MuseScore 3 so we can see them. Whoops, that's not MuseScore 3. This one's MuseScore 3. And we're going to look at them side by side and I'm just going to uh, talk about differences that we see a little bit and then you know I'm just going to be all over the place today because it's been a whirlwind of activity is what I would say a whirlwind of activity these last few days uh, you know even though again I'm not directly involved um, uh, with the development, uh, I've just been doing a ton of things kind of behind the scenes here. So, all right, this is what we see with MuseScore 4. We have tool uh, menus at the top, we got some toolbars, we got a side panel, and we got your score. MuseScore 3 uh, is over here, and typically when you look at that, you would be seeing the sidebars on either side, and then the score kind of uh, squished up in the middle there. So one of the things that uh, was decided was maybe by default it's better to get a little more space and um, put both of the inspector and pallets on one side. Uh, you know, you can move them back where they were before if that works for you better, um, but I just wanted to point out that that's a difference that you will notice right away is that uh, instead of, so the inspector is now called properties and it's over here on the left in a tab here rather than on the right. The other thing you'll notice is that some buttons have moved to the bottom. Concert pitch is now on the bottom, page view, page view versus, uh, um, you know, continuous view, the zoom controls, some bu buttons that were on the toolbar up here have moved to the bottom status bar. But other than that, um, you know, not a whole lot. I mean, visually, things look very different. The differences are going to be in how your score looks and in how your score is capable of sounding. And those are some of the things we're going to talk about. You've heard me talk about these before. But I want to back up a little bit here and talk a little more generally about what MuseScore 4 actually entails and, you know, what, what's been involved here. So those of you who have been following... Uh, well, following MuseScore in general, following my uh, my things in uh, over in in particular, you you know some of what's been going on. MuseScore 
I've been involved with MuseScore since the very beginning, since literally the day MuseScore 1 released. Uh, you know, I've been in actively involved in, in helping out with MuseScore related things. And MuseScore 2, I was very heavily involved in the development of. MuseScore 3, I was somewhat involved, but that's when these the new team that is now kind of directing things came on board and started steering things. And uh, I... Uh, worked with them and did a lot of a uh, lot of work on MuseScore three and three point one, three point two, etc. And um, so I was very heavily involved in MuseScore three, which brought about uh, some major changes. Uh, so MuseScore two brought about linked parts, which was a big deal, and tablature. I think MuseScore three brought about automatic placement, which helps avoid collisions. MuseScore 4 is going to bring out some engraving improvements that we're going to talk about, as well as sound improvements we'll talk about, as well as some user interface improvements. Now, I see comments about downloading and connecting with the hub and it being a problem, and yeah, I've been seeing other reports of this. All I know is, yeah, the servers are getting slammed pretty hard. Tons of people are trying to download right now. So um, that is going to be a potential problem right there. Um, as far as firewall problems, you know, that's probably something you might have to deal with at your own end if the firewall isn't allowing the connection. But I will tell you that MuseScore, that the Muse Hub, if you click the gear icon at the top right of Muse Hub, it's, there's an option that says something about community improvement features or something like that disable that and may and that'll try to connect only to one particular server um, and that might improve things but uh, details I really can't uh, I, I, I don't I unfortunately I have no connection to the, anything having to do with the installation so I can do my best to uh, to guide people, but yes, it is true that you can download MuseScore 4. That's a very good point, uh, Dave. So let me actually pop over to where I can type into the chat and just give the link directly. Well, I did give the link actually directly, but let me uh, let me jump there so you can see where this is. If you come to MuseScore.org, you're going to see where it says free download, but you can download MuseScore without MuseHub. You won't get the new Muse sounds right away because you'll need MuseHub for that, but if you choose the download without MuseHub option, um, then you can at least download MuseScore and get it running, And because this should take you to a, uh, well, actually, I guess, yeah, it'll take you here. And what you're going to want to do is click here where it says MuseScore 64-bit without MuseHub. This will download from MuseScore's own server rather than the server that MuseHub uses so that it'll hopefully work better for you. So that's a recommendation I can give for right now. So, um, let me uh, return a little bit to my story about uh, MuseScore 4 here. Um, so what you would want to know uh, about this is really from the very moment the new team got involved, which was right about when MuseScore 3 released, it was shortly before MuseScore 3 released, this was like four years ago, they immediately started planning on MuseScore 4. You know, the wheels were turning, they didn't know what shape it was going to take, but they knew that they wanted to get MuseScore 3 out so that they could begin working on something that was going to be kind of revolutionary and new, and that's what MuseScore 4 is, uh, is aiming to be here. So MuseScore 4 has some stuff in it that is already revolutionary and new, and then 4.1, 4.2, etc., there's really big plans for further uh, further improvements that will be also pretty big deals. So, um, And one of the things that had to happen is MuseScore 4 had to be kind of re-engineered as far as how it works under the hood, how some of the... Un how how the code works. That's uh, all I can say. There's a lot of the same code still there from MuseScore 3, but they had to rewrite a lot of things to make possible some of the improvements that we're going to be seeing. So um, that is why it took so long. And then at some point along the way, at some point during those last four years, they uh, decided, you know what, we're going to develop our own uh, orchestral playback library it's um it's it's um sounds for you know making your instrument sound 
pretty incredibly realistic. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll play you some more demos of that. We've talked, we've uh, you know listened to some things before. We'll listen to some more things today. So they decided they wanted to basically build their own. They were originally thinking, well, they might just try to build in support for a third-party program called Note Performer, but ultimately was decided, no, no, I think we can do this ourselves. And they bought some other company. Well, they they uh, in it they. Uh, basically acquired StaffPad, which was a, a iPad and, and a tablet program, not just iPad, but it actually started on Windows Surface, um, that had some great orchestral libraries. And, you know, I don't know the whole ins and outs of which came first, the chicken or the egg, but I do know um, that uh, um, StaffPad is sort of integral to how Muse Sounds came to be. And the same person who developed StaffPad is heavily involved with the development of Muse Sounds. I don't know more about the connection than that, but that to me says a lot already. So, um, and so by the way, so uh, yeah, it is a free program, will continue to be free. Muse Sounds is always going to be free. One of the things with Muse Sounds is they want to publish the specific specification for it so that third parties can use Muse Sounds as they are, but also so third parties can develop additional sound libraries that you can install. Now, it's possible some of those will end up being paid offerings. Who knows? But yeah, the fact, the goal is to um, make MuseScore the best music notation program in the world. And it's, you know, long been the most popular. And with MuseScore 4, you know, it's got a serious claim to have leapfrogged Finale and Sibelius in a lot of ways in terms of the playback as well as the engraving. There's, you know, there's different schools of thought, different areas in which one program has strengths and, and others. But um, uh, overall, I think what we're going to find is people are really going to be taking notice of MuseScore and saying, wow, this isn't just a free alternative to the good programs, but it's a good program that happens to be free. That's, you know, this is, today is going to mark the turning point about that. So, um, so anyhow, uh, let's start off, I'm just going to run, uh, we're looking at engraving improvements. I'll talk about those a little bit, but let's hear some more music because that's, you know, what I think really uh, uh, is kind of useful for people to hear. So we heard this one last time. Um, was it last time or sometime recently? But let's hear it again. This is my music, my MuseScore Cafe theme with clarinets. So... Um, Yes, and, and Michael was kind of joking when he said MuseScore 5. I, there there are no plans that I know of for MuseScore 5. There's a lot of plans for 4.1, 4.2, but the plan is that this huge change for MuseScore 4 was it, and then everything's incremental after that. That said, someday I see an online score, you know, a sharing platform kind of like Google Docs where multiple people can work at once and everything's cloud-based, everything works that on online that's that's in the cards that'll happen you know 10 years from now that'll be a thing probably um so that that might be an excuse for there to be a new score five anyhow so let's go ahead and listen to this clarinet choir version of the music master class theme let me make sure first of all i'm going to open the mixer and there's a nice button here for the mixer and I just want to make sure all the right sounds are selected because, you know, every time when I just updated to the latest Muse score, uh, I want to make sure that uh, it's, it's getting all the right sounds. So let's hear Music Masterclass theme music with clarinets. I mean, I play the clarinet, and usually if you play an instrument, you're especially uh, hard on synthesized imitations of it and say, well, that doesn't really sound that much like the thing. But I don't know. I play clarinet. I played bass clarinet, and I got to say, this sounds like a bass clarinet to me. 
right? This sounds like a clarinet. I mean, these, the, the degree of realism in the sounds themselves, but also how they are combined so that when one note is followed by another, there's like different samples and different processing to try to capture how the transition between the sounds work, um, you know, for all the different instruments. And there's just a ton of work, instrument by instrument, note by note, to tweak these things. And it's continually being tweaked and improved. When someone says, hey, the transition on the oboe between this note and this note sounds a little off because of whatever, that was one of the things just fixed a few days ago. I mean, it's that level of detail, trying to get, like, what does that work? And, like, for me, I haven't reported this yet, but as because it still amuses me, frankly, but this that tweet I think I mean I don't have an E flat clarinet to try that with but I feel like it w there's like a scooping effect that happens in there that's somewhat realistic but maybe somewhat overdone and so that's like one of the things that we can like debate about is like oh but it's like it, it's realistic is it is it just is it the best um so anyhow that's clarinet choir let's hear something else I want to put on a uh a um do, 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 where's what I'm looking for? A choir piece. So this choir piece here um uses uh, I'm again checking to make sure it's using Muse Sounds. This is using the Muse Sounds choir. And for a synthesized choir, also, I mean they're notoriously bad. We're not gonna hear lyrics, it's not that, but for just the basic sounds, I think we're going to agree, or at least I think uh, most of you will agree, this is some of the better synthesized choir sounds that you will have heard. That is the choir. So, um, so let me address some of the questions that are coming in here. The Muse sounds that have been released so far are billed as an orchestral library, which means the focus is on orchestral instruments, so bowed string instruments, um, as well as piano and harp, and then winds, and in particular the winds you typically find in an orchestra, and brass, and again, the, the brass woodwinds that you find in an orchestra, brass that you find in an orchestra, and percussion that you find in an orchestra. What we what there is not yet is guitars and electric basses and so forth. Um, that is coming. It's already been announced that a Muse guitar is already being worked on, and I assume it's also going to have electric basses and things. Um, uh, so Dennis is asking if having the master slider on the... <coughs> <clears throat> the right is changeable, and um, not that I know of, but I've, I haven't heard anyone. Uh, this is actually like, let me, let me think about it. Most mixers that I have used do that. They put the master on the right. There's all the channel strips and then the master section on the right. So this feels the most like what most physical mixers that I've ever used, how they work. So, but, you know, it's not impossible if enough people request that it be uh, movable to the left. It's not impossible. So, um, so uh, anyhow, that's, uh, that is the story about that. An accordion, same story right now. There is no accordion sound. I would expect 
over time there to be more and more sounds. So we know guitars are coming. We know marching percussion is coming. And I think that's also going to include some additional wind instruments, but I'm not positive. I think it said something about front line, which I don't know if front line literally, like if that, like Pete, I, I don't know if any of you are in that sort of marching percussion world, but does the term front line to you suggest that it might include cornets and things like that? Or does it just mean percussion instruments on the front line? That I don't know. Um, so uh, so we know Muse guitar is coming. We know marching percussion is coming. Anything else is like, you know, further down the road. But sure. And the fact that the, the uh, specification is published or going to be published so that third parties can develop their own sounds too. Yeah, I'm sure someday we'll see. Uh, um, uh, we will see additional sounds like accordion and also Richard organ. Right now, the only... Um, uh, let me think. The only organ sound is a Hammond. Uh, and let's let's flip over now to look at a piano piece. There's the one I want, ceviche. Um, so let's hear this first with piano, and then I'll flip in a couple other sounds. So here is a little piano demonstration that I wrote. Uh, this is actually what I use in the Mastery Music Score 4 course as the piano demo. That vocal piece we just listened to is the choral demo. So I have like a series of tutorials that walk you through creating these pieces step by step so that you learn how to enter the tempo, how to enter the notes, how to enter the pedal markings, how to enter, you know, this cross staff notation here, the octave lines, everything that's involved in piano notation. I have a, a series of tutorials that just walk you straight through that process so you can skip over all the other lessons and just jump to, how do I actually do all this? So anyhow, um, that's my spiel there. Let's hear this with piano. And again, we make sure, yeah, this is grand piano. And then we'll hear this with some of the other sounds as well. Oops. Try that again. That's the piano. So I'm going to check out because if I go to Muse Sounds here, if I go into the mixer and look at what's in Muse Keys, let's hear uh, Hammond organ just because. So the thing is, organs have tons of different stops. And, you know, this is going to be <laughs> a typical Hammond sound that's essentially uh, let's let's uh, pull out all stops, as it were. It's not literally all, I don't think, but it's a it's a heavy Hammond sound. So Hammond, you would not want the pedal, right? Because that doesn't, that's not a thing. So on, I'm going to just select all these things and delete them. And now let's hear it again. So this piece wasn't written for Hammond, and that's a silly Hammond sound to use. So ideally, we would want organs with lots of different settings and things, and someday that'll happen. The one cool thing, it, well, not just one cool thing, but MuseCore also supports VST instruments. That's something I hadn't mentioned. Uh, MuseCore 4 does. On Linux, that's not there yet. It's coming soon. But on Windows and Mac, you can use VST instruments, meaning any VST organ instruments you have access to will now work directly within MuseCore, which is going to be great. So yeah, that, that crazy... Uh, um, that crazy sound there for, for organ wasn't really appropriate for this. Stephen, um, great uh, question about uh, uh, screen reader accessibility. So MuseCore 3 was already reasonably well accessible on Windows, right? So if on Windows with NVDA, it worked pretty well. With JAWS, it worked pretty well if you installed a script. On Linux, it worked pretty well if you installed a script. On macOS, basically didn't work at all. Now, all of them work out of the box including Mac OS with VoiceOver, also Windows with Narrator, and no scripts required. So it should be the case that right out of the box, MuseCore 4 works really well with screen readers. The one thing I don't know, because I haven't had an opportunity to test, is MuseHub, how well it is currently working. When it first came out, it wasn't very screen reader friendly. So downloading the sounds was going to be difficult. Supposedly that's been worked on, but I haven't had an opportunity to test yet. So at most, you might need help 
downloading Muse sounds. But you can definitely install MuseScore 4 and then run MuseScore 4, everything with screen reader, and a lot of really nice improvements. So I'll do another whole session on accessibility. But there's a lot of really nice improvements to the accessibility compared to MuseScore 3. All right, I want to flip in a couple other sounds. So the Hammond sounds kind of kind of silly. But um, I mean, it's it's great for what it is. Let's hear this thing on harpsichord. Let's hear this thing on harpsichord. <laughs> okay, so harpsichords don't have those notes. So it didn't play them. That's actually one of the things that is going to be uh, probably coming in an update is like ways of faking the notes that are outside the actual range of, of the instruments. Um, but so like, let's, um, you know, talk about everything that just happened with that harpsichord. For, so for one thing, I don't know how many of you have played a harpsichord in real life, but harpsichords work by plucking the strings as opposed to a hammer hitting the string. And that sound of the pluck. Oh, Michael, I was just about to say that. Thanks for pointing that up. Notice that, yes, the harpsichord ignored the dynamics. I, I, I had never tried that before, but you're absolutely right, and I had noticed that too. I was going to comment on it. Harpsichords aren't capable of playing dynamics because they, they, it's just a, me, a mechanic, the thing, that mechanical thing of plucking the string. No matter how hard you press that key, it just plucks the string the same way. The whole reason a piano was called a piano is the full name was pianoforte, right? And it was called that because it was actually capable of playing both soft and loud, where a harpsichord is essentially always soft. So, uh, yes, the harpsichord has that degree of realism where, A, it wouldn't play the notes outside its range, B, it ignores dynamics, but C, really listen to this, you can hear the pluck sound. I mean, you can tell those strings are not being hammered. You can really hear it going plink, plink, plink. You can hear that plucking. Listen again. So absolutely, fr Frank, you are right that what I'm hearing live right now sounds better than what you're hearing because you're hearing it go out through the Internet and come back out the other side, some compression and other stuff going on. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Some of the subtleties of what I'm talking about um, are not coming through. I do want to check something. I, wanna, I just want to hear that for myself. So humor me for a moment. Okay, so I would say I can I can still hear that plucking when I hear it through my other system, but yeah, it's a little more distorted. It's not as clean of a sound as it is in real life. So there is that. So um, so this is why it's called harpsichord indeed, because it is a it is a harp. And that, speaking of harp, this was my next plan here. Let's come over and hear Muse Harp playing this. Because, okay, so Marla, I would love to get your opinion on this. But the thing that I've always been told is that to some extent, if you write music for piano that's not too crazy, there's a reasonable chance that it's playable on harp. You know, if it's, if it's you know, doesn't, if it doesn't do too much highly technical things that are very pianistic. And I wasn't thinking about that when I wrote this, but I wanted it to be simple enough to use as a demo. And so I suspect that the things that I do here are probably not unre unreasonable to play on the harp. So uh, let's hear what it sounds like on harp, and then you know we can see uh, if it's uh, actually feasible to play, because I'd be curious. All right. So that sounds pretty good to me. There's a couple places I noticed, like this D is sort of surprisingly quiet. Well, that time it sounded okay. So, so here's another thing about Muse Sounds. It uses a technique called round robin. And round robin means 
essentially uh, that if you play the same note multiple times, it's not just going to play the same sound. It doesn't have just one recording of a harp playing a D. It has multiple recordings of a harp playing that D. And I don't mean at different volume levels. Yes, of course, at different volume levels, it has a hard pluck and a soft pluck. But it also, even at one given dynamic level, it's going to have multiple recordings of that same D so that every time you play the D, it doesn't sound exactly the same. And this might seem like it's sort of gratuitous, like it's like, oh, well, you're just going out of your way to randomize things. But no, it makes a big difference in our perception of the sound, how mechanical it is, and it comes in really handy on things like these repeated passages. So, da 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 dum da 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 dum These repeated notes, the fact that the second note is actually using a different sound than the first note, that's true for any for a lot of instruments because if you play a, the same note multiple times like the string isn't vibrating when you hit it the first time when you hit it the second time the string was already vibrating and now you're rehitting it it's a subtly different sound right so um round robins are used in music sounds now i can't tell you exactly which instruments use them and exactly how they use them but i do know it is a thing and so there are places like that where repeated notes can sound much better. So, um, so yeah, Stephen, I think there's a lot of people are having trouble connecting uh, to the servers right now. It's, it's being overwhelmed, I think, by overwhelmed with the demand. So you might have to sit tight for a little bit and wait for that to settle down. Uh, when the beta came out, that happened as well. And it was, it was fine by just like six hours later. So, you know, maybe just try later today, or if you're like, you know, somewhere where it already is late, just try tomorrow. But um, my guess is you'll be fine. So anyhow, round robins are a big thing. And speaking of round robins, let me do another, actually, let me just try another sound in here, because I was going to try one other thing, I think, and I don't remember what it was. Um, there's, oh, the Wurlitzer. So, uh, yeah, Michael, you'll probably appreciate this. The Wurlitzer, uh electric piano was really big in the 70s along with the Fender Rhodes. And a lot of people try to imitate Fender Rhodes to various degrees of success. Maybe not as many people bother trying to imitate a Wurlitzer. But that's what I played when I first started playing jazz in, this, in the, uh, I guess, 80s. It was on a uh, Wurlitzer electric piano. And yeah, this is basically it. Wurlitzer pianos, just like Rhodes pianos, had a very different sound when you hit them hard because then the hammer would kind of max out on the metal, the metal bar that it was hitting and create this kind of a slightly distorted sound that was characteristic of the instrument. And uh, yeah, so this uh, this is capturing that. Um, so uh, um, so Stephen's also asking about brass instruments. So yes, let's go ahead and flip back over to um, uh, my thing with the clarinet choir and I'm just going to change some instruments here and show you what's available. So under Muse Sounds, under Bass. So there is not yet a euphonium. That is the single biggest request. During the beta, lots of people were testing and saying, oh, I think you should add this instrument or do this and make this change. Request for euphonium was the single biggest request. So I have no doubt that euphonium is coming at some point because so many people are asking for it. Um, so, so far though, not there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put trumpet on my top part. I'll make a couple trumpets here, a couple trumpets. And then for the third part, I'll go with a horn. Uh, brass, horn, and F, and then for the fourth part, would I be better off? Someone, brass person, tell me. Well, I'll try. It. I'm a bass trombone. I'm going to go with bass trombone. I was trying to decide between trombone and tuba, but um, uh, I'm going to go with bass trombone. And so now let's hear it. So I haven't done any mixing or any adjustment of this. I haven't thought about whether the ranges work or anything. But let's just go ahead and hear this thing with a brass quartet. <laughs>
All right, there you go. So yeah, there's some places where I would want to make some adjustments to the dynamics and so forth for the brass, places where uh, the dynamics that I originally wrote in are definitely overdone for brass. But anyhow, those are some brass sounds. Um, so saxophones, you want to hear some saxophones? Let's hear some saxophones. Let's do it. Uh, woodwinds, let's go with just a soprano, an alto. Oh, what's wrong with things? New sounds, woodwinds. Out. So the sounds are in alphabetical order here, uh, which isn't really ideal, of course. Um, we'd like them in score order, at least I would. Uh, if you uh, other if the instruments, when you add an instrument to your score, they're in score order. Uh, but if you want to change from one new sound to another, um, they're alphabetic which makes finding things like a saxophone quartet a little trickier. All right, here comes saxophone quartet. your saxophones for you so um so yeah there you go so the being able to order the instruments in in the listing within here um yeah that's being talked about what the options might be but for now it it, it is what it is so anyhow tons and tons and tons of of sounds and so i say it's orchestral instruments but it does at least include saxophones right because sometimes you encounter saxophones in uh, an orchestra. So there's so much to explore with the sounds, and you all have heard probably, but I'll, I'll go ahead, and I'm not going to try to tax my system by trying to play live my, um, my orchestral score, but I am just going to play a little bit of my orchestral score from online here. Oh, that's interesting. It was sorted differently. Complete redesign of the score or manager? Ah, just changed. Okay. So I'm um, going to play a little bit of my score. Here's the beginning of this orchestral score. All right, I'm just going to skip to a uh, more climactic spot at the end. Well, actually, I'm going to play um, this one spot where you can kind of hear instruments uh, in a little dialogue. I think it's a very useful spot to understand about uh, the different instruments. And then I want to move on and talk about engraving stuff because, you know, that's actually the area that I have more familiar more familiarity with. <laughs> So these are, by the way, you asked about basses. All you get for basses is what we're hearing, which is contrabass, like orchestral contrabass section, all bowed. Well, I mean, if you put pits in there, it'll play pits, but it's going to sound like an orchestral pit. It's not like a jazz walking bass line. Harp. some of the different instruments here.
So that is like a good sampling of all the different instruments of the orchestra. I didn't write this piece to be like, a, you know, an orchestral demo, a young person's guide to the orchestra or whatever, but uh, kind of works that way because it does have that section where you get to hear each instrument featured kind of one by one. Um, and so you get some idea of this. Um, so, uh, and, and Stephen, yes, it is great to support VSTs, although I think you will find that what Muse Sounds does goes above and beyond what's possible with a VST. In other words, this is no tweaking whatsoever. I didn't have to like go into every note and say this note's this way and this note's that way. Um, I didn't have to tweak every note. This is just the default playback in MuseScore. I mean, I didn't have to do any individual adjustment of sounds to get it to do that. It just does these things, and it figures out all this stuff kind of automatically. With a VST, you can get decent sounds out of the box, but to get it to sound even close to this, you'd have to spend a lot of time tweaking the attack of each node and the decay of each node and things like that. So um, so I think you'll find that a VST will take a lot more work to get it to sound this good. It, it'll be possible, but it would require a lot of work. So Michael's asking about jazz sounds, and yeah, I have no doubt that jazz sounds would happen at some point, for sure. So, as exciting as sounds are, I'm excited by engraving. So I'm going to talk about engraving for a little bit. Um, and I want to bring up the MuseScore 3 version, and so we can compare and contrast just real quick here. Um, this is MuseScore 3, and the thing is, I did a lot of the work on MuseScore 3 and MuseScore 2 before it to get it to even look as good as it does, but anyone who's a professional music engraver, or even maybe not professional, but just seriously, you know, um, work, you know, works on it seriously, could tell you any number of things that are not good about this. So, um, oh yes, engraving, Steve, is, is the, it's a technical term that isn't, it basically means how the notes look on the page. So the spacing between the notes is a big part of it. Uh, how the symbols kind of collide or don't collide, right? So it's a very visual aspect of things. So it's, it's definitely a little hard to describe from uh, the perspective, you know, of, you know, if you think about like Braille, it's always the same, right? There's a standard for Braille where character cells are always exactly the same height and they're always exactly the same distance apart. Music engraving is notes that are on the page, but the spacing and the size of things is very subjective. And so there's a lot of decisions to make about how to make this look the best. And so uh, MuseScore 3 would do a reasonable job. I mean, there's nothing here that looks absolutely terrible. And so, yes, it definitely comes from the days of literally using engraving plates, like printing presses. So there's nothing here that looks so bad that you can't read it. But there's any number of things that are not good. Like, check out this measure here, the spacing between the F sharp, the E, and the two Ds. It's too wide in the middle. Why? Because of these accidentals down here. And they're causing uh, extra space in there, right? So these two accidentals on the, the lower voice are causing extra space to be added between those eighth notes. Then compare this measure, the third measure, to the fourth measure. The third measure, all these eighth notes are widely spaced. Why? Well, because there's accidentals on, on this, this B flat right here. This flat sign needed extra space to avoid you know, hitting the ledger lines on the D before it. And then you score spread out everything in that entire measure to uh, even that out, but then the next measure doesn't doesn't have the same spacing. So we end up with eighth notes, like these two eighth notes here, that are much more widely spaced than these two eighth notes here in the next measure. That stuff isn't good. Um, this angle of this beam is too steep. Be beams are not supposed to be angled that steeply. They're, they're supposed to be either horizontal or at most one staff space difference. Look at this cross staff beam here and how weird it gets in the middle. And uh, look at this place here where I have sixteenths in the right hand while there's triplets in the left. And MuseScore is trying to slot each of these notes. It's trying to slot this D in between that F sharp and A, and it's creating extra room for it. This B is trying to slot between this A and C sharp. And so er this is taking up too much space and it's uneven. So any number of things like that. Also, look at this right here. These two eighth notes compare the length of their stem to these four eighth notes here. It's the same D, 
but the stem is longer when it's a pair of two than a pair of four, that's because we special cased uh, pairs of two to get them to do uh, certain things, and then pairs groups of four were just left to fend for themselves, basically. So anyhow, that's a lot of the issues. I mean, that, I could go on. There's even more things about this uh, that are awkward. This triplet spacing here is awkward because this D being slotted between that F sharp and E, right? So music score three... It, it, it's okay, you can read it, but there's a lot that's kind of janky about it. And this, this slur here is colliding with that dot there. Um, there's, yeah, just many things. So Muse Score 4, I, I, of course, selected this uh, very carefully to uh, point out that these are the problems that are solved. So trying to hit all the things that I talked about, well, here... The uh, slur, oh, the ties, I called them slurs, I think, but the ties are not colliding with the dots. So there's one thing for you right there. Here's another thing for you. These accidentals are no longer causing extra space. These accidentals in voice two are no longer causing extra space in voice one. These four eighth notes are now nice and even, as opposed to that big gap we had in Muse score three. There's still extra space allocated for this B flat here so that that flat sign doesn't collide with the ledger line, but the overall spacing is such that um, this measure, when we have two eighth notes here with no accidentals, they're approximately the same distance apart as the two Ds in the next measure, right? So that unequal spacing of measures, of adjacent measures, is dealt with. This uh, cross-staff uh, beam looks better by default. I mean, we could still tweak things, but it looks better. Huge improvement here, where I have the 16th notes in the right hand against the triplets in the left. Mu score is now okay with overlapping the note heads a little bit. This D no longer is trying to slot in between that F sharp and that A. It still starts after the F sharp because it comes later, but the note heads overlap because that's okay. Same in the next beat, where there's eighth notes in the right hand against triplets in the left. Yes, the D comes in between the F sharp and the E, but it doesn't force a lot of extra space there. It doesn't force any extra space. It just looks nice and even. And those unequal stem lengths are now the same. So, um, uh, so um, man manually adjusting measure stretch now works at least as well as MuseScore 3. It's almost never going to be necessary now because if you are using measure stretch to correct the many errors that MuseScore 3 would make, like if I wanted to use stretch in MuseScore 3, I would do things like say, well, I need to make this ne measure narrower by pressing, oh, I don't have my uh, keyboard thing on. I've gone this long without needing it, but um, you know, I can try to use the left curly brace to narrowize that measure and then I can make this one wider and try to even out the spacing manually like that. But um, uh, that, um, you know, that's um, a process. In MuseScore 3, if you, you, you won't need to do, I mean, in MuseScore 4, you won't need to do that kind of thing because the spacing is already good, but it's still the case, and it's you can reduce spacing more than you could in MuseScore 3. So now... You can increase your spacing, decrease it the same way with uh, left and, and right curly brace. So it remains the case that you can adjust those things. There's also um, uh, basically, how, how would I put this? The, the overall spacing algorithm was completely rewritten. And I wasn't involved in the rewrite, but I was sort of involved in the design of the rewrite. In other words, I helped explain how I think this should work and how, how the existing code should be adapted. And then they brought out a professional music engraver to steer the things further. And then someone else came on and actually implemented this. So I was, you know, somewhat involved in the initial planning of this new engraving. But it's, it's, it follows very specific engraving rules in which a quarter note takes a certain amount of space. A half note doesn't take twice as much space. It takes one and a half times as much space or you can set it to be 1.4. You can set what you want that ratio to be. And so these settings, if I go to Format, Style, uh, Measure, there are now these new settings here. Uh, minimum note distance is still the same, but spacing ratio is now this new setting that 
controls this. Uh, you know, whether a half note is 1.5 times the, the, the takes 1.5 times as much space as a quarter or whether it takes 1.4. Now, if you set it to one, check this out. If I set it to one, uh, well, this score isn't one where you're going to really see the difference. But actually, I expected that I would. Let me, let me just try that again, but then I'm going to give up on it because it's not that important right now. Um, oh, I didn't change it. One, boom. If you set it to one, the spacing is literally the same. There's the same amount of space between these two eighth notes as there is between the, the dotted half and the eighth or between these two quarter notes. If you set the spacing ratio to one, all notes take exactly the same amount of space. If you set that same spacing ratio to two, now it's direct proportional spacing. A half note now takes literally twice as much space as a quarter note, and a quarter literally twice as much as an eighth note. That's not normally how music is done, but sometimes you'll see like percussion method books and things like that use that sort of uh, direct proportional spacing. So anyhow, MuseScore now has much finer control. The default spacing is much better, and there's much finer control about these things. So um, yeah, the, the piano sounds from Muse Sounds are really nice. They're definitely really, really nice. They started off kind of, I thought, harsh, weird sounding, but they, they improved dramatically during the beta. In fact, they probably improved more than anything else to me during the beta was the sound of the piano. All right. So, um, so I've talked a lot about sound, talked a little bit about engraving, don't have that much more to say about it. I just want to talk about some other big picture things here. So I talked about the fact that yes, the the interface is rearranged a bit here. The um, yeah, and you're right, Michael, that the uh, the sp the two the the double spacing ratio is will give you essentially by default equal width measures because uh, it, it just works out that way mathematically. So your measures will come out equal width, kind of without having to try very hard. Um, in fact, let me just go ahead and do that because now I want to see it. Um, and that's a thing that the real book does. And I've talked about this before when talking about jazz charts, that normally you don't want equal width measures, but it can be useful in music in lead sheets because the chord symbols we want to be spaced appropriately. So uh, yeah, when I did that, it couldn't fit four measures anymore. Um, so I would have to adjust some things here to make that happen. Um, oh, in this case, there's also an indent, so that's throwing things off. But in any case, it's, it will have the effect of equalizing measure widths um, if you play your cards right. So um, yeah, and it therefore will have that effect. So anyhow, um, so we talked about sound, we've talked about engraving. Overall, there's just some nice usability improvements, like the fact that I can, like right then, I so check this out. I went and selected this measure and hit enter. And when I did that, I got one measure stretched across the bar. Why is that? Well, it's because there's a, a break there. But I made my breaks invisible. The, um, oh, the anacrusis, that's all. I was wondering why that measure was so narrow, um, but good call. Um, so this measure has a break on it, but I previously hidden it. and. It used to be you'd have to go to the menus to do that, but now right here in the properties panel, you can make uh, frames and formatting and other things visible right here from the properties panel. You can also access style settings here from the properties panel. Also, in MuseScore 3, if you selected like a whole measure, prop the inspector would go blank on you, right? In MuseScore 3, if I select... Uh, a whole measure, the inspector basically can't show you much. It just shows you a few buttons because you've got different types of elements selected. But in MuseScore Muse 4, with multiple elements selected, it's happy to let you still work with things and say, I just want to work with the accidentals in that measure, or I just want to work with the notes in that measure. So um, there's just so there's a lot of improvements in how things are basically organized, which controls you can get to easily. You can get to slur right from the toolbar. You can get to uh, articulations right from the toolbar, right? So there's there's just lots of usability improvements also. So um, 
And and Paul's talking about the strings, and yeah, I would say that strings in fast passages definitely struggle a little bit, and that's like a known issue that's been reported on GitHub and flagged as a priority to fix relatively soon. So I would assume, the, okay, so here's the other nice thing to know about how Muse sounds work. Muse score, the actual program, it, it released now. Well, there's probably not going to be an update f until after Christmas, I would guess. I mean, you know, and, and 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 I wouldn't expect updates more than once a month or so. You know, there'll be like a bug fix. There'll be a 4.0.1 fixing whatever the most important bugs are. Um, and then a 4.0.2. But they'll be spaced out like months apart, probably, these updates. But Muse Sounds, because it's downloaded automatically through that Muse Hub, it's they can update any day they want. They can say, hey, we've got a we've got a fix for the violins. Let's just push that out there. And then the violins update that day and you get you get it that day. So they're constantly updating new sounds like almost every day during the beta. There was an update to some sound or other. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you will expect to see sort of constant improvements. So like, let me uh, finish out with one more piece of music here that I would want to play, and that is the Music Masterclass theme using violin, using the string quartet sounds, because yeah, I'm um, I'm ambivalent about whether it's where I want it to be yet, because it's, I think, still a little too mm, glidey for my taste. Uh, where did I put that thing? Symphosium. All right. Um, the the strings kind of have this like built-in like portamento slot portamento sliding from pitch to pitch a little bit um, on the solo strings, and it's not always there because uh, it was there always, and they backed it off. But I feel like it's still a little too much, and so that op that issue is still open on GitHub, and so I expect that they will um, continue to work on it. So uh, let's go ahead and hear. So this course is taking a moment to load, but uh, hopefully it'll be there in a second. I'm looking at the mixer just to make sure I've got the right sounds in here. So we'll listen to this and then we'll kind of wrap up. Because you know this only takes a minute. It's going to take longer to load than it will to play, it looks like. All right, well in that case, if it's not going to want to load while I'm uh, broadcasting, then I'm not going to worry. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's hear this thing now. <laughs> You know, it's kind of a it's kind of vibrato y also. So there you go. I mean, there's a lot of things that are realistic about it, but it's a little whiny <laughs> for my taste. But it's realistic whining is what I would say. It sounds like how some violin players might choose to play it if I didn't tell them, hey, could you be less whiny about it? That's my take anyhow. All right. So I've been talking and talking and talking, and I feel like uh, it's time to uh, call it a session. And I really hope you've enjoyed this and that, um, uh, you know, that the the servers calm down and you're all able to download and install MuseCore 4 and that you're able to download and uh, install the Muse sounds and start playing with these things. And by all means, if you haven't done so already, enroll in my course. I've got tons of videos there already. I got more coming and it's going to be a constant ongoing process of, uh, um, of learning because of the community aspect of this course, the fact that it's going to be tied into the whole community uh, site, and I've got some features that I'm ready to enable to uh, kind of push that up to the next level as well. So anyhow, it's yes, definitely exciting times, and uh, I'm happy to be uh, whatever part of it that I've been able to be. I'm really happy. So um, uh, th that is the session, and heck, I wonder what's going to happen if I turn off repeats right now. Yeah, I'm not even bothered. I'll just let it play out. So, uh, tomorrow will be the Music Masterclass. And uh, in Music Masterclass, we'll be continuing to work on the holiday fake book uh, kind of project and talking about that and uh, looking at chords and so forth. So I hope everyone has a, a, 
a fun time talking about holiday music tomorrow. And then I'll be taking the next couple weeks off from these live live streams. So I hope everyone, if I don't get to talk to you tomorrow, hope you all have a great holiday. And uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and Happy Muse Score 4.